I remember this rather embarrassing moment in my life. I always knew how to put things together and pull things apart. It has come rather naturally to me. I hardly struggle with that area of expertise, uh, except that after I put things together, maybe I may have a few extra bolts and screws left over. This feeling of expertise did not, did not last long until our microwave blew out. And we needed a new microwave. As a good husband would always do, I went and ordered the microwave. It was delivered a few days later. I had my parents with me and my wife looking on as I unwrapped this unit. My parents had this beaming look on their face as they were looking at the sheer simplicity with which their son was unwrapping the microwave and had no difficulty with the task. I pulled it out and I was ready to install it. When my wife made this comment, aren't you going to read the manual? To that, my response was, who reads the manual? And like all good dads, my dad chimed in, chimed in saying, well, he's an engineer. He worked on aircraft, so he's got this all figured out. As I started the installation process, about 30 minutes later, having tried hard with my dad holding up the microwave and my mom trying to support it and my wife bearing the brunt of the Lord, I finally decided maybe it's a good idea to read the manual. Putting aside my chauvinism and with great humility, knowing what my wife must be thinking about me, I glanced through the manual. And it did not take long to realize that I was trying to install the microwave with a wall mounting plate already in place. What I did not take time to read in the manual was that the microwave already came with a mounting plate. So what I was trying to do was install the microwave with two mounting plates back to back. The moral of the story, always read your owner's manual. They're there for a reason. God has given us the word of God as an owner's manual for our salvation. It gives us everything we need to know for life and godliness. But as we do with any other owner's manual, we either don't read it or we read it superficially. And in the end, we wonder why we do not do well in our Christian living. And as we read the owner's manual, we will see that we need to be praying for wisdom and understanding to know God deeply and praying that God would open the eyes of our heart that we may know the hope of his calling, the glories, uh, the riches, riches of his glorious inheritance and the greatness of God's power. Today, we will be focusing on verses 18 and 19. And the main truth we need to know from these verses is this. That we may know the hope of our calling. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And the surpassing greatness of his power towards us. Who believe. And our sermon today will revolve around this propositional truth. So what must happen for believers to know these truths? Paul is praying that God would enlighten the eyes of their heart. And so the first truth that we see is, are you praying that your heart would be enlightened? Verse 18a. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18a. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened. The truth of God's word can only be understood if enlightened by the Holy Spirit. The heart of the Bible is associated with the mind. And the mind has to do with understanding. Today's culture, when we think about the heart, it has to do with emotions. Not so in the Old Testament and New Testament times. 
We know this because in the story of Jesus' birth, the shepherds came to see the baby. And we read in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, that Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. Meaning she kept these things in her mind. So Paul is praying here that we would come to know these truths that he is praying for categorically in verses 18 and 19. And that God may open the eyes of our heart for our understanding. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 18 and 19 states... That the unsaved people or the unregenerate people of this world are darkened in their understanding. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. Meaning the unsaved or the unregenerate or the unbeliever have their understanding darkened and are removed or alienated from the life of God. And Ephesians 4, 19 reads that they are, as a result, walking in the vanity of their minds. According to the Apostle Paul, the unbeliever has understanding, but that understanding is darkened. Meaning they have a veil over their hearts. They are like people who have eyes, but they cannot see because they are blind. And as a result, the light cannot enter the eyes. This is the same with spiritual truth. Unregenerate men or unbelievers cannot recognize spiritual truth. Why? Because they are blinded. Their understanding is darkened. As we said, they have a veil over their eyes that they cannot see spiritual truths. So they cannot understand them. You can give them the most glorious truths in the world from the word of God day in and day out. But they will never, they will not be able to appreciate those spiritual truths. We know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. That the God of this world has blinded. The eyes of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The Holy Spirit alone can remove the veil and give understanding. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse six reads, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You remember the story in Acts chapter 16 of Lydia as Paul was preaching the gospel to some woman who had gathered by the riverside. The Bible reads in Acts chapter 16 that the Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. We know the conversion of Saul, who is on the way to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Saul was a Pharisee, and he had been tutored under the most famous rabbi, Gamaliel. He was well versed in the Old Testament scriptures. But Saul, in spite of all the knowledge that he had, he was far removed from knowing Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior. He did not know the Messiah. In fact, his life goal, his life ambition, he was dedicated to capture anyone who would call the name of Christ and kill them. Until on the way to Damascus, the Lord opened his eyes, scales fell off his eyes, and he was able to see the truth of the gospel. Only God can shine this light into our hearts. Only God can enlighten our hearts. And as believers, we have the eyes of our heart enlightened. This is why we became believers in the first place. This is why we are able to appreciate the truth of God's word. 
But here, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, the Apostle Paul is praying especially for believers. Not for unbelievers, for believers. And he's saying to believers who are already in Christ Jesus, people who are fellow heirs with Christ, who are adopted into his kingdom, who are adopted into his glorious presence, or will be in his glorious presence, he's talking to believers, and he's praying that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened. This means that although the eyes of our heart have already been enlightened, we always, we will always need the continual enlightening work of the Holy Spirit. We will never be in a position to say that we will never again need the enlightening work of the Holy Spirit. As long as we live in this world of sin, in our infirmities, in our flesh, as long as we are on this side of eternity, we'll continue to need the enlightening work of the Holy Spirit. We would need to be in continual dependence upon the Holy Spirit. This is why we read about the psalmist praying in Psalm 119, verse 18. He says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous truths from your word. And this is what we see in Luke chapter 24, verses 31 to 32. Remember the story where after Jesus' resurrection, he was on the way to Emmaus and there were two disciples and those two disciples did not recognize Jesus Christ. They had all the information they needed in the world. They were right there in the presence of the Messiah. But they were not able to recognize the Messiah. They had all the information they needed. But after they spoke with Christ and they ate bread with him, the Bible reads, and you should notice this as you read that passage, their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he vanished out of their sight. Even though these disciples had all the information they needed, they couldn't recognize Christ. It was only after God took the information and drove it, jabbed it into their hearts, that their hearts burned. And this is what it means to have the hearts enlightened. Our hearts enlightened. Folks, a good question to ask at this point of time is have you grown in your spiritual knowledge and understanding of the word of God? Where are you today compared to a year ago? Or maybe look into your life five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. It's not just how much knowledge you have accumulated, but have you learned to apply biblical truths into your life? Have you grown to apply the gospel into your daily living? And for us to be able to grow in our spiritual understanding and the knowledge of God's word, we have to pray constantly for this. This ought to be our constant daily prayer. Anytime you open the word of God, it should be preceded by prayer to your heavenly father. It would be your prayer before you come to church on Sunday morning that the Lord would open the eyes of your heart that you would be able to understand the text that is being preached. This would be your prayer on Sunday night as you prepare for Sunday morning that the Lord would continue to do His work in the life of your spouse. That the Lord would do this work in the life of your children. That as they sit in church and hear the word being proclaimed, that they would be able to understand the truth of the gospel. Not just gain intellectual understanding and head knowledge, but that it would go into their hearts and it would penetrate their hearts and their lives. And that they would be able to understand the truth of the gospel and that they would be able to apply the gospel into their daily living. Isn't this what we read in Psalm 25? Verses 4 and 5. The psalmist says, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. 
Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Meaning you are praying to God even right now as you're listening to me, not thinking of the pot roast in your home waiting for you to come in. You're thinking on, you're praying on the word of God. You're meditating and saying, Lord, speak to me. On a sidebar, the question to ask yourself is this. Do you even have an interest for God's word? Or is it a boring and dull activity? Maybe you only want to be entertained. Maybe you're more concerned about your emotions being aroused than your intellect. Maybe you want your ears tickled. Folks, it is God's desire that you would grow in your understanding of God's word and the doctrine of God's word. It is God's desire that the eyes of your understanding, your comprehension may be enlightened. And as your mind is equipped with the word of God, it will stir your emotions. And in turn, your emotions will turn you to do God's will. Does that make sense? It doesn't go backwards. Your intellect, your mind is stirred, which will stir your emotions, and in turn, you will want to love God and do it. Let's go to the next truth. The next truth is found in verse 18b of Ephesians chapter 1. Are you there? Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that was verse 18a, and the second part, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. The second truth we see there is, are you praying that you would know the hope of his calling? Let us first understand the meaning of our word hope. In this statement is the realization of the assurance of salvation. And we'll connect it as we move along. The next word we see in that phrase is the word calling. Now, there are two callings in scriptures. Two callings. There is a general call, also called the universal call, or the external call. And then there is an effectual call, also called a particular call, or an internal call. And I'll explain this as we go along. The general call, also called the universal call, is the verbal proclamation of the gospel. By which sinners are called to turn from their sin and trust in Christ for salvation. Every Sunday morning, we have the proclamation of the gospel. You turn on your radio, you have the proclamation of the gospel. It's the general call. It, the call goes out to all people. Matthew chapter 22, verse 14 reads, For many are called, but few are chosen. The general proclamation goes out to many. The external call is given to all people. And there are many that reject this call or the invitation to the gospel. And folks, this external call or proclamation of the gospel is so essential because without the proclamation of the gospel, the sinner cannot call upon the name of the Lord. We know that in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the question arises, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? That is why the preaching of the gospel is so essential. We need to proclaim the gospel. And this preaching of the gospel is the general call. Now we come to the second call. The second call is the effectual call or the internal call or the particular call. Now, mankind is exposed to the external call or the proclamation of the gospel, but they will not be able to understand the call or the external call in their natural condition. You know why. Why would they not understand the proclamation of the gospel in their natural condition. Because we are dead. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 very clearly says that we are spiritually dead. Like cadavers. 
entirely unresponsive to the gospel. Spiritually dead people don't respond. It's like you go to a hospital bed and you're looking at a dead man laying on the bed and you say, reach out, reach out the medication. It's right there on the chair next to you. You just have to grab it and drink it and you'll have life. This man is dead. He cannot reach out. So even though the gospel goes to them and the general proclamation goes to them, dead people do not reach out. They do not respond. And this is where we see the Bible is very clear about it. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 10 says he cannot hear the truth because his ears are uncircumcised. Their hearts have been blinded. But this is where the effectual call of God comes in. The effectual call of God or the internal call of God comes into a life of a person and draws him from his dead state to making him alive for God. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, the Bible says He made us alive with Christ. By grace you've been saved. This is the sovereign work of God. It happens only in the heart of a person who has been particularly called who has been foreknown, who has been elected, who has been predestined from before the foundation of the world. And God grants them faith. And with the gift of faith, they are able to believe in the gospel. There is no way you and I can be saved unless and until you believe the gospel. But that belief is only made possible by the effectual call of God. Would you please turn with me to Romans Chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 31. And this is the glorious chain of salvation that we see here. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And who are those people? But those who are called according to his purpose. This is the effectual call or the internal call. And he says, for those whom he foreknew. That means he knew before the foundation of the world. Even before they came into the world. He knew them. He also predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. That's again the effectual call of God, the specific call of God, the internal call, or the effectual call of God. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The ones who are called according to his purpose are the ones who will respond to the gospel. And the ones who will respond to the gospel are the ones whom the Lord foreknew from before the foundation of the world. And those whom he foreknew, he predestined. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. This calling is a special calling. God, through the gospel and by the Holy Spirit, sends out this general call to the whole world. And of all the people who hear the general call of the gospel, God calls a particular group who have been predestined. And these are the ones to whom the general call becomes factual. And such people will respond to the proclamation of the gospel without resistance. If you're a Christian and you're seated here this morning, You did not become a Christian because you chose Christ. You became a Christian because God did his work in your life because he chose you. This is what we read in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. It says, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works. Do you see that? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works. 
but because of his own purpose and grace. Do you read that again? Because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And folks, I want you to come back to Ephesians 1.18 because I want to connect these truths together. Ephesians 1.18. It says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. When you know that God is the one who is the author of your salvation. When you know that God is the one who drew you out of your darkness, who drew you from your dead state. When you realize that God is the one who gave you eternal life, it was not what you did. It was God out of his sovereign will that called you and that you will never lose your salvation. When you realize that you will never fall out of salvation for any strange reason, you will realize that you will never fall out of grace for any strange reason that you would be able to look up to God and you would be able to have assurance of your salvation. That's what Paul is trying to say here. That you will certainly be with him in heaven one day. That you will be transformed into the image of his glory. That you will be in his precious presence someday. That you will never, ever fall out of grace. That you will always be with him. That you can never lose your salvation. That's the hope of his calling. Does that make sense? I want you to turn with me to a passage to kind of get this more. Let me, let me drive this a little more here. Turn with me to please First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. Verses 2 and 3. Beloved, we are God's children now. Isn't that amazing? We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. And who is that person? Jesus Christ. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. That's the hope of your calling. That one day you will be like Christ. And if God has done the most impossible thing that could happen on planet earth, that is call a dead man out of his deadness and give him life, eternal life, how much more true he is when he says you will be like him, that one day you will see him face to face. And that should encourage you. Folks, there are people here in this church who are going through difficult times. I know that. Some of you are struggling maybe with a difficult marriage. Or maybe you lost your job. Or maybe there's some trial in your life that you alone know and you have not shared it with anyone. You are crying out to God. But you still come to church and your hope is in Christ. Because the hope that you have is a hope that cannot be extinguished by any storm or any trial. It cannot be put out. As we read in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39, Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in this creation. And Paul goes on to say, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus because of what he did for you. And that is unchangeable. Nothing can change it. You cannot do anything to change that. Aren't you glad that's the way God designed it? And so when you go through hard times, you can look up to that calling and say, thank you, Jesus, and your hope is in Christ. As the songwriter says, my hope is built on nothing else but Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And that's where your hope is. But, you know, folks, it is possible to forget all of this, right? Sometimes as we go through life and we go through the nitty gritty and the grind where the rubber hits the road, we forget about this easily. And this is why we need to be in prayer for one another. Lord God, in the midst of our trial, in the midst of his trial, in the midst of her trial, open the eyes, oh, enlighten my eyes. 
that he may or she may see the hope of his calling or the hope of her calling. Are you praying this for one another? Are you praying this for your spouses? Are you praying this for your friend? Are you praying this for your people around you? That as they go through trials, that they may come back to remind themselves of the hope of his calling. Is that clear? Let's move on. Paul now goes on to the next truth. And that's Paul's third prayer as we come to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18c. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Are you praying that you would know his inheritance? Now here, the riches of his inheritance can be taken in two ways. Hang in there with me. First, it could be taken as referring to God's inheritance of us. Meaning we are God's possession. We are his portion. We have been purchased by the blood of Christ. We belong to him in that sense. Second, it can be taken to be speaking of the inheritance that God gives us. Referring to the spiritual blessings that belong to us. That God has given us. And as you read commentaries, commentators are torn between these two opinions. Uh, whether the possession, you're God's possession or you're talking about the possession that God's giving us. The inheritance that God's giving us. In my opinion, we can see ourselves in both of these positions. Yes, we can see ourselves as the inheritance of God's possession of his people. And we can also see ourselves as the inheritance that God gives his people. In the first case, on that final day, the great and final day, as we get a glimpse of the glorious company of the redeemed, the possession of Christ to which we belong and among whom we'll be spending the rest of our eternity. And we'll see all of that as finally we'll see that great possession standing in front of God. Or we could also look at the riches of the glorious inheritance that we enjoy as saints here on earth and look forward to the heavenly riches that's coming. Paul wants us to meditate on the riches of the glory of his inheritance. And why should we do this? Because it brings comfort to us. For no other reason could the apostle Paul have said what he said if he did not really understand this. Would you please turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Romans 8, 18. Paul reads, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. It means Paul is focusing on the glory that is going to be revealed, whether it's that the fact that we belong to Christ and one day we will be in his glorious presence, or the fact that one day we'll be able to enjoy all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places that are ours in Christ. He says, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to that glory. That's the focus we need to have. Jesus said this. He said, in this world, you will have troubles. Paul is not telling us to pretend like everything is fine and and say I'm happy all the way. We will have hard and difficult times. But in the midst of our difficult trials, we can say like Paul did in Romans 8.23. Would you scroll down a little bit into verse 23, please, in Romans 8. And he says, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, he says, grown inwardly. As we eagerly wait for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is what the apostle said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17. He says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal glory, eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. This gives us the ability to persevere in the midst of our trials. To keep fighting. So as you you dwell upon it. As you apply your mind to it. As you read scriptures. 
You remind yourselves of this. You repeat this to yourselves every day of the riches of his glorious inheritance that's waiting for you. And as you do this, as the songwriter says, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. As you live in the light of his glorious presence. This is why First Peter reminds us that we are heavenly citizens. He was writing to a people persecuted, who lost their jobs, who lost their families, who lost their homes because they were persecuted for their faith. And as Peter writes to them, Peter says, I want you to focus on this, folks. Your home doesn't belong here. Your home belongs to the heavenly places. You are a heavenly citizen. And right now, you're just living in your earthly tent. This is not your place. You're an alien here. You belong to the heavenly places. And this is what Paul wants us to do in in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18c. That we are to pray that the Lord would open the eyes of our heart. That that we would be able to understand the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And this is going to be a prayer. As you sit here in church. As you talk to one another. That they would be able to understand this. And focus themselves on this glorious truth. Every day of their life. Fourth. We come to verse 19. Let me read verse 19 for you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might. Stop right there. Are you praying that you would know his power? Are you praying that you would know his power? Here we see the power of God that's already at work in the saints. We are believers because of God's power that is at work in us. We cannot gain salvation without the power of God or the help that God gives us. It is God who enables us. It is God who helps me. It is God who empowers me. It is that power that Paul is talking about in verse 19. The power that is at work in us who believe. So let's now work into the details in verse 19. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us? Let's look at that phrase. The word immeasurable means excel, surpass. It means go beyond everything. And it's in the present tense. It indicates that this power is a power which is continually surpassing or excelling all other power. Ongoing power. And we see this power displayed in our salvation. Because we know we are saved by the power of God. Because no one can make himself a Christian. Unless and until God does his work in the lives of a person. The next word is the word greatness. Meaning great size or extent. It exceeds all standards of physical magnitude. Meaning his power is so great that it surpasses all of the powers in the world. In verse 19, we continue to read the greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. Now, interesting, Paul uses different words for power in verse 19. Paul uses four different Greek words for power. In verse 19. Four different Greek words for power in verse 19. Why does Paul throw just about every word for power in the Greek to describe God's power towards us who believe? Why does he do that? Couldn't he have just said God's power? But he uses four different Greek words for the same word power. Let me show you that. Paul uses the first word for power in verse 19. That is the greatness of his power is the Greek word dunamis. From which we get our English word dynamite. This is inherent power. Inherent power. Paul then uses a second word for power. This is found in the phrase. Towards us who believe. The word believe in the Greek. Is the Greek word energio. From which we get our English word energy. This is again power. But it is power working out. It's permeating everything. This is operative power. 
And this is the power, as we read in verse 19, the greatness of his power towards us who believe. Then as we move on, we read in the next phrase, according to the working of his great might. The word Paul uses here is the word might. And the word might is the Greek word ishkush, which is endured power or inherent power. It's like you see a muscular man and you see his big muscles being displayed. He does, even if he doesn't use them, just standing there and you can see his muscular body. It's the reserve of strength that he has. It's the strength that one has in his possession or ability. So that's what Paul uses that word here in verse 19. He says, according to the greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great. Then he uses another word for power, and that's in the next word, might. And that's the word that we see here, which is kratos. Actually, great is kratos and might is ishkush. So here Paul is saying that there is power, power, power all the way through for a believer. And if you were to read this phrase again, it would read, and let me put this in perspective here. It would read the greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the power of his power and power. Do you see that? So Paul is essentially saying that you have God's power four times. And he's praying that you would have the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you'd be able to understand this unlimited power that is in you who believe. So how does this apply to us? Are you afraid to evangelize? Saying, I don't have the power to witness for Christ. The Bible says in Romans 1.16, For the gospel is a power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Are you saying I don't have the power to suffer trials and endure it victoriously? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, We have in this treasure, we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Colossians chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 reads, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. In other words, God's mighty power enables you to strengthen, to walk in your trial steadfastly, patiently, and joyously. Are you saying I don't have the power to do God's will? Would you turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word works there is the word for power, energio. It is God who is energizing you. It is God who is working in you. Are you saying I don't have the power to serve? Serve God? Paul writes in Colossians 1.29. He says, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy. That he powerfully works within me. And if you labor and try to labor and try to serve without getting this energy from God, without getting this power from God, people will get burned out. And you probably heard about a lot of things. Pastors getting burned out. Men in the ministry getting burned out. I think if you try to do your work serving the Lord by depending on your own strength, you will get burned out. Are you saying I don't have the power to overcome temptation and live holy lives? Would you turn with me to 2 Peter, please? 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. 
It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. By which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things. You want to escape from temptation? His power is available to you. We have all the power we need. This is why Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We don't have to go running around for more power. We have all the power we need, as we read in Ephesians 4.19, uh, Ephesians 1.19, power times to the time 4. It's all available to you. God's power to us who believe. Great is the power of God. To meet the problems of your life. The power God provided you. Is the same power. As we'll read next week. Is the same power. That raised Christ from the dead. And you can draw upon this power. By reading scriptures. And by living scriptures. By stop trust, you know, By putting an end to trusting in yourself. And trusting in God. This is why we read in 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 5. It says. Fool by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We looked at four truths today. That God would enlighten the eyes of our heart so that you'd be able to understand the truth of God's word. That you would be able to know the hope of your calling. That you would be able to know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And that you would be able to know what's the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great power. May the Lord give us the grace to work through this uh, in this passage, even as we celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. I want us to draw ourselves, draw our attention to the scriptures that so reminds us of our need for a Savior in order to live a life such as this. Gracious Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the word that has been given to us. Where can we go, Lord? Who has the words of life? And in these last days, you have spoken, you have spoken to us through your Son and your Son, and this is found in the living word of God. And as we look at this majestic truths from God's word. Help us to cling on to them Lord. Lord in our weakness. In our feeble times. In our tough days. During our tough times. We forget about these truths. Help us to remember these truths. Help us to cling on to them. Help us to hold on to them. Maybe. Hold ourselves accountable to other brothers and sisters who will remind us these truths from scriptures. And may we take this community that you've given us, this community of believers, seriously. The help that you've given us in this community to hold one another accountable for your glory and for your honor. Thank you for this feast that you spread out for us. And as we continue to celebrate this feast, we will do so, Lord, till the day you take us. But, Lord, our heart goes out to you, everything that you've done for us. And, Lord, we just want to express this from the bottom of our hearts and say, Father, we love you. We love you with all our heart, soul, and mind. Thank you for this feast again. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's children say, Amen.